Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so why don't we get started? Thank you very much for coming out and uh, being here today. Uh, we have a visitor um, from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Yanis is here to talk to us about um, his uh, latest work on using declarative analysis, especially if, as it applies to um, developing um, uh, pointer analysis. Thank you, Ben. So thanks for coming. Uh, I will talk today about using declarative languages for fast and easy program analysis. And this is primarily the work of Martin Bravenbor, who has been, had been my postdoc for the past year and a half, and uh, just this month uh, got a job at Logic Blocks uh, and uh, left. Uh, but Martin has done a fabulous job of everything I'm going to describe today. Uh, feel free to stop me with questions throughout the talk. That's number one. Number two, this is a brand new talk hasn't been debugged. I've never given it before. So also stop me with procedural issues, like that's too much code on the slide. Slow down, because I couldn't even parse it. So stop me. Make sure you follow what I'm saying. So the quick overview of what we do is that we do fully declarative pointer analysis. And it runs fast. And I mean really fast. So how we do it? Executive summary is that we have a novel optimization methodology which relies on exposing indices and it's uh, uniquely tailored to the features of our language, which is data log for expressing this uh, pointer analysis declaratively. And why you care about this? Well, first of all, like I said, this is fast. So it's really impressively fast. It's quite sophisticated. It's simple. And it's fairly different. So for people who have done any kind of uh, pointer analysis before, uh, it has several major lessons uh, to be learned. Uh, so for instance, one big thing that I will come back to is that unlike most sophisticated, precise pointer analysis uh, in recent times, we do not use binary decision diagrams. And we analyze how good or bad binary decision diagrams are for this domain, and I will discuss that. But that's a very, very quick overview, again, of what I'm going to say. So why do we do program analysis? I think you, you have the main idea. We do it, first of all, for optimization. That's a traditional reason. Nowadays, not many people care so much about optimization, about static optimization, although it's still a very important area. We also do it for software understanding. So it's particularly important for helping us understand the meaning of our programs. And something that goes very much with that, we do program analysis to find bugs. And there are many people here, for instance, that use program analysis algorithms to find bugs in programs. In particular, I will talk about pointer analysis. So what is pointer analysis? It's probably the best known low level program analysis. It's something that's, that's so standard, it come, it's part of the standard vocabulary of programming languages. It answers the question, what objects can a variable point to? Obviously, in a language with pointers. So if I have a program like this, and it allocates some objects, uh, like new A1 here, and new A2 down here, I may want to ask, what objects can variable B, up here or down here, both variables B, uh, what objects can they possibly point to? And objects have to be represented by some static abstraction. Obviously, I don't know how many objects will be created at runtime. There could be billions. So typically, we represent the objects by allocation sites. So the real question becomes, what allocation sites, like what new statements, flow to the variables of interest? And a traditional analysis may compute a solution for points to that starts, for instance, with something like, oh, variable A in procedure foo or in function foo can point to this allocation site, new A1. And variable A in procedure bar can point to this allocation site. And then if we do a standard pointer analysis that doesn't care about context of calling procedures, we just flow information on, on all call sites. So if I have an identity function here, 
I will say that the A variable of the identity function can point to both call sites because both call sites flow to ID through these calls to ID up here and down here. And similarly, if I want to see what flows out of ID, I can conclude that variable B in procedure foo can get both allocation sites, both A1 and A2. And similarly, variable B in procedure bar can get both call sites, both uh, allocation sites, A1 and A2, because again, they flow into ID, they go out of ID. Now, this is an imprecise result. Everyone sees why this is imprecise? So the whole idea is that this is an identity function. It's like it doesn't exist. It's like I say B gets A in both places. Uh, the allocation sites do not cross pollute each other. So what we have traditionally in points to analysis is something that you will see me mention every now and then, which is context sensitive points to analysis. And context sensitive points to has many variations. The, the most standard variation is what's called call site sensitive. And it distinguishes the information that flows into a procedure by the call site. So for instance here, a context sensitive points to analysis would remember that the A variable inside ID only holds the allocation site A1 when called from inside procedure foo. And it only holds this object, this static abstraction of an object, the allocation site A2, when called inside bar. And this helps us distinguish what objects actually flow to what variables in our original program. And we have a fully precise answer. So this is clear enough? OK. Now, pointer analysis is a fairly complex domain. So I did a search of the ACM digital library for points to analysis or pointer analysis. Uh, it returns 2,300 results. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, this doesn't necessarily correspond to the exact number of papers, but it gives you an idea. And if you actually look at the keywords that are used to describe the titles and the abstracts of those results, they can be fairly complex. So for instance, you'll see keywords like flow sensitive and field sensitive and heap cloning and context sensitive, which I mentioned before. And you will see terms like binary decision diagrams and lots and lots of other terms. You will see terms like inclusion-based and unification-based and on-the-fly call graph construction and KCFA and object-sensitive analysis and field-based as opposed to field-sensitive and demand-driven, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of richness in this domain. Similarly, if you open any one of those papers, most likely you will find many algorithms in them, in the paper, and they're, they're all fairly obscure and fairly complex. So here's an example of algorithms found in just one 10-page pointer analysis paper. So we have algorithm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You get the idea. The point is the variation points are very unclear. Any decision you make affects the running time of the analysis very crucially. It changes the algorithm completely. Like the order that you apply steps in uh, changes the algorithm, changes the runtime complexity of the algorithm significantly, results in a completely different algorithm in pointer analysis. Whether you will do exception analysis first, and then you will propagate the results of exceptions, uh, and after that you will do the standard approximation of context or whatever else you do. So just simple decisions like that matter tremendously. And even though we have fairly broad characterizations, like we say a K context sensitive analysis where the context is a call site, not all algorithms in that space are equivalent. They could actually have completely different asymptotic complexities. They could have a completely different practical runtimes. So anything I do, any little change I make to an algorithm is a new variation point. The correctness is very unclear. You need to go over things like those. The, if I propose a new algorithm, it's incomparable in precision with previous algorithms. So very rarely you will see pointer analysis papers that compare to other papers in terms of precision because a very small detail may change the results very, very drastically. And also the analysis are incomparable in performance. So what's the goal of the work that I'm proposing here, that I'm describing here? 
I want to talk about declarative pointer analysis. So the idea is that we have all sorts of algorithms that people have proposed. And all the algorithms have many, many different variation points. They just happen to be a, a conglomeration of lots of design decisions. And they're very unclear and many times obscure. We want to take these algorithms and squeeze them down to their essence. So we want to do some analysis work and get policy decisions out of the algorithms. And at the policy level, I don't care at what order some results are applied. I only care whether my algorithm's inherent precision, for instance, is that it has two call site contexts, and it has a context-sensitive heap. And I don't worry about the terms. I will explain what these are, or we don't really need them. But I will care about, at the policy level, what's the inherent precision of the algorithm. And then I will distill these policies down to a declarative specification. So I will just very declaratively say, this is what the algorithm is supposed to compute. So that's the analysis step. And then there will be a synthesis step that hopefully will get us back to very, very efficient algorithms. But what we actually write as the program is this highly, very high level, very declarative specification. So that's what I claim that we have done. And we can get very efficient algorithms in the back end. So I'll start with the first step, taking, going from existing algorithms to specifications, distilling existing algorithms and going to specifications. First of all, I keep saying declarative. And uh, a standard question is, what does it mean to be declarative? And not everyone is on the same page with that. For instance, just two days ago, I was with a friend of mine who is a computer scientist. Uh, my friend Anthony is a computer scientist, but he doesn't do programming languages research. So he was saying, what does declarative mean? That's just a buzzword. There's no difference whether something is declarative or not, right? And as it happened, we were at the Crater Lake National Park in Oregon, and we were hiking. And we saw this sign, which says, hikers below do not throw or dislodge objects. It makes a big difference whether this is imperative or declarative. Is this telling me what I should be doing? Or is this just saying something about the state of the world? Notice that there's no punctuation in any of these. So if you get that, you see the difference, at least, of declarative versus imperative. But a bit more seriously, here's the uh, dictionary definition of what it means to be declarative in, a, in the domain of programming languages. So declarative denotes high-level programming languages which can be used to solve problems without requiring the programmer to specify an exact procedure to be followed. So in this work, we're trying to specify the what and not the how. And we're trying to be high-level. Our analysis will not specify control flow, will not specify the order of operations. There are no side effects in our specifications. And it, they're really specifications. They're not programs. They're not algorithms. We will not be concerned immediately about the running time. After we write the full specification, we will be concerned about the running time at the very end when we want to produce efficient algorithms from those specifications. So that's the idea. So what are current approaches to pointer analysis? We are interested in program analysis for, in pointer analysis for Java. That's what we do. That's what we compare against. And currently, for precise pointer analysis, I would primarily say that there are three different systems out there. There's Paddle, which uh, is written in Java. It, it uses, I'm sorry, it uses Java. It uses relational algebra. It has a specialized language for specifying the analysis, and has a backend that relies on binary decision diagrams. And I'll tell you a little later what these are and what exactly are the trade-offs. There's Walla, which is the IBM, uh, the IBM framework for program analysis, which uses Java as its specification language for the analysis. It's a very conventional approach. You specify the algorithms declaratively. Up here, we do have some high-level language for handling relations. There's BDDBDDB, which pioneered data log for realistic points to analysis. But really, the analysis is very staged. So there's, a, there's data log there, which is a declarative specification. But there's also Java for doing call graph construction, especially for the precise analysis, not for 
uh, context insensitive ones. And the back end, again, is binary decision diagrams. So one point to take away from this slide is that there's not a singly purely, there's not a single purely declarative specification. So what we want to do, first of all, is make it fully declarative, not a mixture of something that's semi-declarative together with imperative code. And there's coupling of specification and algorithm in all of those. So there are specific data structure choices, for instance, such as binary decision diagrams. So when we specify the algorithm, these are fixed choices. So in contrast, what we have is a pointer analysis framework that's called dupe. It's data log based. I'll tell you what that is. It's a pointer analysis framework for Java. It's highly declarative. It's very easy to express sophisticated analysis. And it has all the benefits that I alluded to before. It has a very rich set of analysis. It's richer than almost anything else out there. It's perhaps comparable with Walla. Uh, but it's definitely a superset of Paddle, which is the top academic system in terms of richness of sophisticated, precise analysis. Uh, we, do things, uh, we do things highly precisely. We have call site sensitive, object sensitive, uh, with an object sensitive heap analysis. We do on the fly call graph discovery, on the fly exception analysis, all sorts of fancy things. Anything you might want from a very sophisticated point to analysis framework. And it has a very good support for the full semantic complexity of Java, including the very clever and sophisticated algorithms that uh, Ben Lifshitz uh, developed as part of his PhD uh, when he was at Stanford with BDD BDDB, on, on the BDD BDDB system. So the key contributions here, what we actually did in this work, is we expressed complete and complex pointer analysis algorithms completely in data log. And the specifications are extremely compact. So the core specification, the core logic of the analysis, of all these analyses, all the variations, are about 250 lines of logic. Now, if you want to add to that the exception analysis, the handling of all, of all sorts of different language features, there are a couple more thousands of lines of logic. But overall, this is not a lot of code. This is a very distilled specification. And then we synthesized very efficient algorithms from these specifications. And as I'm going to show, we got order of magnitude performance improvement compared to other definitions of these algorithms out there. Uh, so the main approach that uh, we have to get the good performance relies on some heuristics for searching the algorithm space. And the heuristics are optimizations that are targeted, that targeted at recursive, highly recursive data log programs, so highly recursive domains. And we demonstrated scalability with an explicit representation. So we're not using binary decision diagrams, which again is kind of surprising. So these are surprising contributions, and I can be showing you quotes from various people that actually did not expect that this is possible. For instance, expressing complete uh, pointer analysis in data log, this was not something that was considered easy or even possible. Andre Laudak, I think in his dissertation, uh, has some paragraph that says, encoding all the details of a complicated problem analysis problem uh, purely in terms of subset constraints, which is effectively data log rules, may be difficult or impossible. And the scalability and efficiency are extremely surprising as well. So for instance, there are multiple claims in the literature, and I'm just listing some of them. Here's one from Andre Lotek that says, efficiently implementing an object-sensitive analysis with a context-sensitive heap, that's what this encoding means, without binary decision diagrams will require new improvements in data structures and algorithms. And really, we don't have very sophisticated data structures, as I'm going to show you. Or John Whaley was saying that much of the scalability of the BDD-BDDB system is directly attributed to the power of the BDD data structure, which again we found not to be the case. Uh, or finally, about the limitations of past systems, uh, we can do much better than Paddle can, for instance, Andre Lotak and Laurie Hendren's system in terms of scalability to complex analysis. So how do we do this first step, going from existing algorithms to a pure specification? Before I tell you that, I'll try to give you a very quick background on pointer analysis and data log. So generally, even outside of pointer analysis itself, 
program analysis is a domain of very heavy mutual recursion. So I have an analysis that computes the points to set for a variable. This is my main point to analyze. What does this depend on? Well, first of all, whatever I computed that variable y points to, because of assignment statements in my program, uh, is also necessary for computing what variable x points to. So certainly it depends on itself. But that's kind of trivial. It also depends on a lot more. One of the standard dependencies that people have studied extensively is that it depends very much on the call graph. And there's a lot of literature on how you actually interleave the call graph computation and the points to analysis computation. So because of statements like this in the program, where we assign the return the value of a function to a variable, certainly the computation of points to results depends on call graph results. I need to know what f actually points to. But because of virtual methods, this goes both ways. So when I'm dispatched on a method y.f, I need to know what y may point to to know what f may be. So this arrow actually goes both ways. The reachable method computation is very important because otherwise I don't know whether an allocation site is meaningful at all, whether I should consider it at all. So certainly I need reachable method computation in order to do a precise var points to, but in order to do reachable methods, I need a call graph. I similarly need to have some abstraction for fields. So I need points to information for fields of objects. So this is typically represented as a relation called fields, point, fields points to. And because of statements in the code like this one, x dot f gets y, certainly fields points to depends on var points to. I need to know what objects can flow to y in order to know what objects can flow to a field. And vice versa. In order to know what objects flow to x, I need to know what objects flow to a field. So this arrow is also double. Exceptions, very similarly. In order to say what objects flow to an exception site, I need to know what E can point to. So exception analysis depends on var points to analysis. And vice versa, in order to know what objects can be referenced by variable E, I need to know what objects can be thrown by a certain exception site. So this is also a double arrow. And certainly exceptions depend on a call graph. Uh, because when I call a method, I need to know what exceptions it can, uh, I'm sorry, when I compute exceptions, I need to know the call graph to know what, I'm, what I can possibly call. So this is just a small set of examples that shows the very rich mutual recursion that we have in various points to analysis tasks, and generally more program analysis tasks. So what we do is we express our analysis declaratively using data log. And this is a perfect choice because what's the meaning of data log? Data log is a language for declarative mutual recursion. So what does data log do, especially for this domain? What we do, first of all, is we take the source of our program and we represent it as a set of relations, as a set of predicates, as a set of tables, if you want to think of it that way, as a big database, in other words. Data log is a language for data processing. It's much richer than SQL because it has recursion. So if we start with a source that looks like this, we want to produce a database. It's just a matter of encoding the source information, so the syntactic information in the source, in two different tables. And what we do here, what we encode here, is a table assign object allocation that remembers that there is an allocation site for uh, A, for object A, for, for objects of type capital A. And there I have an assignment of this allocation site to variable A, the top one. And similarly, this allocation site is directly assigned to variable B, second line. And this allocation site is assigned to variable C. And similarly, I may have a second table for assignments between variables. This is assignments of allocation sites to variables, and this is assignments of one variable to another. So B gets assigned to A, A gets assigned to B, B gets assigned to C. This encodes exactly this code here. After I have everything in the form of tables, in the form of relations, I'm running my data log program. And here's an example of a simple data log query. 
that's the essence of practically any points to analysis that you will see in data log. Not just in our system, but also in BDD, BDDB in the past, for instance. So it's a simple transitive closure computation. So let me first point out some data log features of the language, and then I'll explain the logic here. So a data log program consists of rules, and I'm writing rules here using this left arrow symbol. So I have two separate rules. Every rule has a head. I have the two heads of the two rules here. Data log is all about computing using relations. So everything that you see here is a relation. It's a predicate. It has a true or false value for specific variable instantiations here. I have a head relation whose values I'm computing. So here my head relation in both these rules is var points to. It relates a variable with an object abstraction, with a static abstraction of an object. And then every rule has a body. Uh, I'm writing here bodies as relations that are separated by comma. I, I follow also the convention of having every variable in my program preceded by a, uh, a question mark. So this is a variable. Think of it as a free variable here. I can say var points to for some var and some obj follows to from assign object allocation for some value of var and some value of obj. And I have relations in the body. And from those, I infer the relation in the head. And the way to think about the computation that's being performed is that I'm really doing a database join. So down here, I'm basically saying that the var points to relation, one way to add more results to it is by joining the assigned relation and the past results of var points to when joined over variable from, which is a common variable of both relations as written here. So I do a database join, and I add the results. And of course, you saw right away that we have recursion here. One distinguishing feature of data log is that we can have arbitrary recursion. So for instance, just from the first rule, we can see that all the contents of the assign object allocation relation flow to the var points to results. So we just copy everything. And then we want to evaluate the second rule. There are more ways for us to compute var points to results. So what do I do? I join the past var points to results with the assign relation. So if I join this tuple with this tuple here with B with the first column as the join variable, I produce this new tuple. And now I know that this object can actually flow to A as well. And similarly, following through, I compute this var points to for this program, which is the result of my analysis. Yes? Are the base tables that you created also encoding the flow? So in the examples that I'm showing here, no. In all the code that we have in dupe right now, no. But you could do that. Effectively, the meta comment is the following. There has been very little evidence that anything flow sensitive matters very much for program analysis, for points to analysis. And you can get much of the benefit of flow sensitivity by just converting to, uh, to static single assignment form before you actually run the analysis on the program. All of our analysis run on Java bytecode. We could very, they very directly apply to converted bytecode to uh, static single assignment form. So we can get any benefit that we might get, uh, we can receive any benefit we might get through flow sensitivity. So we have only focused on context sensitive but flow insensitive analysis in dupe. And that's pretty much standard. That's pretty much par for the course in the literature. OK, so as I said at the beginning, uh, especially for the people who stepped in late. This is an undebugged talk. It's the very first time I'm giving it. So if something goes slowly or fast, stop me and tell me. So was this easy to follow, the example? Cool. Yeah. But, but why do you switch the column to the sign? I switch the columns in a sign? There's no, there's no good reason. Right. There's no good reason. I just wanted to have the first one here uh, to make it just simple. I, I could have a sign in the other order, no deep reason at all. I would that. OK. <laughs> Left, right. We, we typically think of a sign as flows 
this flows to there. So uh, to me, it's much more natural to say a sign from uh, B is assigned to A, B is assigned to C. But I can see the other way. But in that case, you want to switch the sign object allocation. Very consistent between the two. Uh, OK. OK. <laughs> I can switch this. But there's no depth there. You will see that we are doing all the, these sorts of variable reordings. We will later be doing them as an illustration of the indices that we will compute for performance. But effectively, the order of variables will switch very much for performance reasons uh, when, when I discuss the optimizations. But that's a good point. I, I didn't even realize that. So at the high level, here are the properties of data log. It's a language for limited logic programming. You can think of it as SQL with recursion or prolog without complex terms. It has no constructors. I cannot create richer objects, just predicates. Uh, theoretically, it captures the p-time complexity class. I can express anything polynomial time in data log, and anything in data log is polynomial time, under some assumptions here, but basically very pedestrian assumptions. It's strictly declarative, as opposed to prolog. So conjunction is commutative. The rules are commutative. Order does not matter. This, this satisfies perfectly what I was saying before about declarativeness. This is purely a specification. And if for us, it increases the algorithm space. We distill existing algorithms into a specification, and then we can actually do aggressive optimization. But the bottom line is that doing data log is less programming and more specification, which is exactly what we wanted. Yeah? Can you use negation in the... You can use negation when negation does not go, th go through a recursive loop. So we use that. That's called stratified negation. And that's what we have. That's what's also supported by our runtime system. So locally, we use negation. But globally, in the global control flow, we don't use negation. We cannot have negation on something that recursively depends on itself. Yes? Along the lines, do you allow think this then too? Do I, do I allow like this? No, two things are not equal? We do, yes. Yes. I mean, on specific points, we, we do have full uh, relation of power, yes. So continuing from algorithms to specification, I'll try to show you some examples of, on how to specify all of those things declaratively. So these are the rules that I showed you before that I argued are the essence of every declarative points to analysis. Let's try to add something more to that. Let's try to add some processing of fields, what's called field sensitivity in the points to analysis domain. So in my program, I may have a statement like this. And I'm representing here by variable names, by data log variable names. But just think of as an object dot a field name becomes a value. So this would be represented inside my computation, inside my analysis, as a relation fields point, field points to, which has a base object field and OBJ. So effectively, the meaning of that is field question mark field of object question mark base obj may point to object question mark obj. This again is a semantic relation. It's something that's computed by my analysis. So what's the rule to compute that? Well, I start from the syntactic relation, which is the input fact. So this relation here is syntactic. It, it represents that there is a statement in my program of this exact form. So store field input relation just says, there is a statement in my program of this form, base.field becomes from. And that's what I have here. And I combine that with semantic information that I got in the past. And where did I get semantic information? I got it from my main var points to computation. So a field, a, a field of object base obj may point to object obj if there is this statement in the program, and I have already computed that this variable base can point to base obj, and this variable from can point to obj. That's the meaning of those two. If I've already computed this, and there is this statement in my program, then I know the top fact. Good? Similarly, there's the other side. What if I have an assignment from a field to a variable? Very similarly, I'm adding a rule that enriches the var points to relation. Here's another way to compute var points to. Well, it's based 
on a syntactic statement in the program. I have this statement in my program. Somewhere it says to becomes base.field. And then it's based on a semantic fact. It, it's based on knowing that this base can point to base obj, which I've computed before. And it's also based on this semantic fact that I've computed before. Field points to base obj, field obj. So in other words, if I know that this points to a certain uh, object, this points to a certain object, I can, compute, uh, I can conclude the fact to the, at the top. These two rules are all you need to add field sensitivity to a points to analysis. And field sensitivity is a big thing. There are lots of papers written about field sensitivity, how it relates in, in precision to uh, field-based analysis, for instance, uh, how to do it effectively, et cetera. That's all we need primarily in our analysis. So this is very modular. We introduce new mutually recursive dependencies without changing existing rules, with just enriching existing rules. And you can see the mutual recursion everywhere. VAR points to depend on field, depends on field points to, but field points to depends doubly on VAR points to. We don't shy away from mutual recursion. We embrace mutual recursion in data log. We want as much of it as possible. I emphasize that because another big discussion in the points to analysis domain has to do with what to do to break mutual recursion. How do you compute the call graph before you do the points to analysis? How do you compute ex exceptions before you do the points to analysis or from a crude approximation of points to analysis and then you successively refine it? We don't care about that. We express everything in full mutual recursion. Yes. Uh, yes. And your rules. So it becomes an infinite recursion, right? Yes. It's, it's an infinite recursion, but data log can only compute monotonic uh, computations because we don't have negation. So everything will terminate. So we just iterate everything until fixed point. That's the, that's the main principle of data log evaluation. Yes. So that being said, we found that as long as you are a sort of recursive cycle, as long as your SCCs are relatively small and self-contained, things work great. Now, if you let it kind of get out of hand, if you have everything essentially being one giant SCC, then uh, you know, while there is a solution to it, getting to that solution generally takes a great number of iterations. We have not found that, but we found, as I'm going to say very soon, that our optimi optimization methodology, which is tuned specifically for highly recursive data log rules, results in more than four orders of magnitude performance improvement. So just writing this and running it naively on a data log environment will get you something that's 50,000 times slower than the optimized versions that I'm going to show. So there's definitely, there definitely needs to be a very heavy optimization step that takes recursion into account. And I'll talk about that. To give you another example, I'll try to do that quickly. How do we do exception analysis? Uh, we want to, let's, let's take the top case first. I want a computer relation throw points to that says, uh, does a, th a certain caller uh, throw exception object OBJ? So does F here throw a certain exception object OBJ? And the logic is fairly simple. Is there a call graph edge from uh, an invocation to a certain to method? Is there a throw points to relation that I've already computed, so again I have recursion, from the to method to that semantic object OBJ? Is the type of OBJ a certain object type? And do I not have an exception handler for this OBJ type inside the caller, inside the invocation? And finally, the method of the invocation syntactically is this caller. If so, I can conclude that F will throw this exception object. This is encoding very, very precisely the Java language specification for exceptions. And the same for the second part that I'm going to show you. Effectively, if we go through the Java language specification paragraph by paragraph, that's exactly the logic it encodes. It's fully precise. All the abstraction, all the approximation gets introduced by the way we abstract away objects. But the logic is perfect. There's nothing there to approximate. And similarly down here, if I want to see 
if this variable e points to a certain object, which is a var points to relation, does this variable point to object obj, I need to see if there's a call graph edge from some invocation to some to method. If there's an already computed throw points to relation from that to method to a certain abstraction of an object, if the type of an object is a known type, and if the exception handler for this type in this invocation is equal to the handler, and finally, if the former parameter of the handler is the parameter that I actually care about. Again, fully following the logic. Now, I used some shorthands here that shouldn't confuse you. I used this function notation. This is just the same as saying this is a relation type between OBJ and OBJ type, but I'm actually telling the runtime system that this relation is actually a function. That's just for optimization. And I use this not exists, which means even if I let a free variable in there, there's no value that can bind this variable, but I don't care to name that variable. But these are just shorthand. The main idea is everything we do is joins on relations. Now, what you just saw has a lot of recursion again, and happens to be the most precise exception analysis you can actually find out there. And this, this was the paper that we presented two weeks ago at ISTA. And it's very, very nice because it's on the fly exception analysis. And we actually show that for object sensitive points to analysis, this makes a huge difference to do the exception analysis on the fly. Otherwise, you either lose a lot of precision or you lose a lot of performance because your intermediate results blow up tremendously. So I showed you the first part of my claim which is going from, specification, for going from algorithms to specification. And now my point is to show you how we go from the specification to algorithms, to very efficient algorithms. Are there any questions at this point? Natural stopping point. Yes. Um, technical point. So you're saying you're monotonic, but then you also have negation? Let's try to figure out how that. Works. No, it's, this is not a negation that can go through recursive circles, uh, cycles again. So this negation does not affect the monotonicity. Uh, the negation you just saw with a not exists, it's not a negation that will go through a recursive cycle. The relation on the right-hand side does not recursively depend on a negated version of itself. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like uh, your claim, if I understand it correctly, is that you can basically, there's no need for staging. You can incrementalize pretty much everything without well, enough optimizations. Is that accurate? we can produce incremental versions of the analysis, you mean? No. Well, so several people. Uh, you can compute pretty much everything that you need on the fly. There's, there's no need for staging. Well, the, so yes, we, there's no need for staging. We compute the deltas that we need on the fly. Uh, so certainly, we don't try manually to do any staging. That doesn't mean that we get incremental algorithms out. There is work about how to get incremental algorithms uh, automatically out of Datalog. In fact, when Datalog was first proposed, when Tom Reps first proposed Datalog some 15 years ago or more uh, as a language for, or not Datalog, but a similar relational abstraction as a language for point program analysis, he did it primarily to get incremental algorithms for free. But we do not do that yet. We don't get incremental algorithms. We, do, we have algorithms that work over the, fo the full program. But we don't do anything to stage them explicitly to get good performance. So let's try to go from specification to algorithms. First, I'll try to tell you what I'm really, uh, what I'm really claiming here. What we actually got is fairly impressive performance results. Compared to Paddle, which is the most complete existing framework for precise analysis, we get very large speed ups for exactly equivalent results. And we mean exactly equivalent results, which is what I said is very rare in the pointer analysis literature. We compare tuple by tuple the relations. We get equivalent results. And we get roughly an order of magnitude performance improvement uh, that ranges for, uh, for a one object sensitive analysis uh, to, uh, it has a 15.2x speed up. It ranges from that to a 6.6x x, 6 .6 x speed up for a one obje object sensitive analysis with a context sensitive heap. And in fact, we actually get much more precise results. These results here are with a different exception handling. If we add our on the fly exception handling, we get much more precise results. 
and we're still much, much faster. So if we really want to have exception handling, we can get, again, almost an order of magnitude performance improvement for higher quality results. And we scale to analysis that Paddle cannot handle. So for instance, we have two call site sensitive plus one heap analysis or two call site sensitive plus two object sensitive heap analysis. So they are really fairly substantial results. Not only we get uh, comparable performance to handwritten code, we get much better performance. And to give you an idea, this is one of the graphs. What's this difference? Well, this is time in seconds. This is an analysis that for Paddle takes more than 6,000 seconds with the optimal settings, so almost two hours. And for us, it takes less than 500 seconds, so a few minutes. That's the difference that we're talking about in the analysis. So where is the magic here? Now, surprisingly, there is magic in very few places. Yes, we do have an optimization methodology. It gives us a lot of benefit. The original handwritten analysis are many times slower. I told you 50,000 times. That's not an exaggeration. So it's between 10,000 times slower and 50,000 times slower. But this is a fairly straight, straightforward data processing optimization. I, can actually, I think I can actually illustrate it to you in this talk. Uh, it has an understanding of how Datalog does recursive evaluation. So that's very crucial. But we don't do something extremely fancy here. We don't use binary decision diagrams. We actually question whether they're needed for pointer analysis. And I'll tell you what our results show uh, so far. And we have some fairly simple domain-specific enhancements that increase both precision and performance in a non-binary decision diagram implementation. So these three are the main points, and especially the first one. So to show you the optimization methodology that we follow, I'll need to say a couple of words about data log evaluation. Here is the rules that I was showing before. So these are the main rules of any points to analysis. Naive evaluation of data log rules translates this down to relational algebra. Exactly the same logic of doing joins that I explained before. We start from an initial value of var points two, which gets the assigned object allocation. And then we repeat and do a transitive closure computation, where on every step, I just do a join. I spent 20 minutes trying to find the right font for the symbol for a join. This is a symbol for infinity. If anyone knows it offhand, please, please help me. I could not find a good symbol for join in PowerPoint. So this here is a join. You will see it on other slides. I'm joining these two relations. I'm projecting on the common variables. And that's what I have in my rules, in my evaluation until fixed point. That's naive data log evaluation, plain relational algebra operations. Effectively, what naive evaluation does is it says, I have the original relations, the original relations here. I join them on every step. I get, I'm sorry. Huh, there's something here that should be, that should come up. Sorry. Uh, there should be another slide here, which I don't know if it's hidden. The main idea is that the results of this join will flow back to these relations. These relations will grow, but on the next step, they will again be joined with each other, the full relations. So that's not what we want to do. In contrast, there's something called semi-naive evaluation in data log, which is practically what all high-performance engines will do. And semi-naive evaluation says, I will take my original relations. And on the next step, I will notice what has changed, what got produced from the previous step. And those are the blue lines here. And I will do two joins. I will do a join of all the changes of this relation, signified here by this blue block, uh, with the full var points to relation in this example. And I will do a join of all the changes of var points to with the full assigned relation. So I will just do the deltas of the relations joined with the entire relation from the previous step or that I have so far. And that gives me the new facts from this iteration step. It's just a very simple incrementalization of the data log evaluation. So semi-naive evaluation effectively can be written 
in terms of rules, a bit like this. Think of a specification, the specification that I showed you before for field points to. This has mutual recursion here. This, this has recursion with var points to in two different places. Var points to happens to be a recursive relation. So effectively, what will happen in semi-naive execution is that we will compute the delta of var points to. We will join it with the full other relation store field and var points to here. And that will become the delta for field points to for this step. And down here, the delta for var points to from the second recursive call will be joined with the full other relations. And that will flow into the delta of field points to. It's just like rewriting the program to be in this form. Yes? No, the engine does that automatically. But in order to develop our optimization methodology, we'll need to know that the engine does that. Because what I'm going to tell you is that the optimization methodology relies on knowing what will be deltas and making sure that the deltas bind all the variables that can be used to index efficiently into other relations. So here's the main idea. For highly recursive data log programs, relation deltas produced by semi-naive semi evaluation should bind all the variables needed to index into other relations. That's the full insight of the entire optimization methodology. And then we apply it in multiple places. So this can require complex reasoning because in the worst case, it's a whole program optimization. And the way we do it so far is that a human needs to be in the loop in the search of the algorithm space. It's quite possible that this can be automated to a good extent, but probably not to the extent of getting the full benefit of a 50,000 uh, 50, fold performance improvement that we get now. So let me try to show you a quick illustration of the optimizations. And there's much more in our upcoming Uppsala paper, which illustrates the optimization in detail. Now, the reason I can illustrate that to you and that I, I can show you the optimizations as data log source transformations is because the data log engine that we use exposes indexing. So the argument order of relations determines which, one, which variable is the best index for the relation. Effectively, the engine that we use does not represent relations. It only represents indexes as B trees. So it's very much like a vertical store in databases, but with everything exposed to the data log language level. And this is an engine that's marketed by Logic Blocks, a, compa a, a uh, company that does this uh, language and execution environment. So how should we think about that? Our relations are multidimensional indices. So the index is organized by reverse argument order. So if I have var points to of var and obj, obj in this case will be my primary index and var will be a secondary index. Everything is represented as a B tree. A possible B tree that represents this big table is this one here. What does it mean that the last variable is the primary index? Well, it means in this case, the last variable is the object abstraction. So this column here. It means that all the objects with the same, I'm sorry, all the tuples with the same object abstraction are close together. So for instance, I have a slice with all the A's in my relation, in my B tree. It's very efficient to find all the new A's, all the tuples that have new A. Similarly, it's very efficient to find all the tuples that have a new B. If I were to represent the relation in the opposite variable order, if I were to say var points to question mark obj question mark var, then I would have the opposite effect. All the tuples with the same value of var would be together. So for instance here, all the tuples with the same a would be together. All the tuples with the same b would be together. I think this is going faint, right? It's fainting every now and then. Yeah. And all the tuples with a new c would be together. So again, this is not crucial for our optimization. This is just the way that I will use to show you the optimization as a data log source code transformation. So it's good for illustration as well. So here. So, so on the previous slide, you said that the, you organize these indices by. Thank you. Reverse argument order. So does it mean that if I were to rewrite my 
input data log to reverse this, your performance would differ? The, the input doesn't matter. Uh, the input data log program, you mean? Or the input relations? No, the input data log program. Yes. <coughs> well, that's actually how we do the optimization. We rewrite, we do source code transformations on the data log program. So we have a, an input specification, and then we have an optimized version of the specification that has all the indices uh, in the right order, and of course, many intermediate relations, which I'll show you how, why they're needed. OK, so here's one heuristic. Always use the index efficiently. If I have a join that looks like this, I have the delta of var points to from obj and the assign from to, this is inefficient because this is supposed to be the small relation. It's a delta, right? It's recursive. We can tell right away that it's going to be a delta on the next evaluation step. So, but it binds variable from, which is not an index variable for this relation with this ordering. So really, when I know a single value, what it may be joined with, I need to traverse this entire big relation assign to find what it will be joined with. That's highly inefficient. I'm just shooting everywhere in this relation. Instead, what I want is to reorder this relation, assign the big one, to make sure that it can exploit the delta from this one. So I only go and I get the values that have the right from here. So for each one value that I get from this delta, I know right away what it may be joined with. I slice the big one very efficiently. Similar principles everywhere. Never iterate over full views. If I have a join that looks like that, and I know that in the next step I'm going to have a delta, I certainly don't want to order things like this, as I said before, with var points too. I certainly don't want to let my local query optimizer, every database engine will have a local query optimizer that will take things on a single join level and optimize them. I don't want to allow it to do this, take the big one and iterate all over the big one just because it has efficient indexing on the small one. And if I don't do anything clever, that's exactly what my database engine will do. What I want is to do this, reorder the var points to relation, and again, use a delta to slice right into that. So this seems very straightforward, right? Why did I tell you before that this may be a whole program optimization, et cetera, et cetera? Well, here's one simple example. It's again the same rule that we saw before for field sensitivity. Here's what happens when we do semi-naive executions. It's exactly the example that I had before for semi-naive evaluation. I have a delta on the first recursive call, and I have a delta on the second recursive call. If we take this rule, these rules here with the deltas, and we convert them to join orderings, here's what happens. I mean, trust me, this is exactly a transcription of the previous slide. I didn't change anything. I just join all of these together. Let's try to see. I want to have an efficient join based on this to index into the other big relation, which is store field. So this binds variable base and variable base obj, which suggests that variable base should be last in store field. But the other rule down here binds from an obj, which suggests that variable from should be last in store field. These two have contradicting requirements. I cannot resolve the contradiction by just reordering the variables of store field. So there's no efficient variable ordering for store field because base and from cannot both be last. So I cannot just do this just by reordering things around. So sometimes I need to do much more. So much more, for instance, may include taking a rule and splitting it in two rules where I introduce an intermediate index. And with my intermediate index, if you actually look at this code, you will see that I have two relations, one of which has base in the last spot. So the recursive relation here, the one that will be delta after the first evaluation step, indexes very efficiently into store field computes a result with the opposite order. It's an intermediate result. And here, on the intermediate result, I index extremely efficiently with the other recursive relation that uses a delta. These very simple reasonings are effectively the full source of getting very good performance for recursive data log programs. So there are some other minor insights when we go from specification to algorithms. 
The first thing that I advertised before is that in our work, we don't use binary decision diagrams. Yes? Yes, it is the strategy for optimizing data log? No. Uh, I'm sorry? Why? Why? First of all, even though data log has been around for a long time, in practice, no one has used it for anything very heavily recursive. The algorithms that people specify in databases are not nearly as recursive as what we would need for points to analysis. So Logic Blocks, the company that builds our engine, is Probably they probably have the most sophisticated industrial implementation of data log out there. We found extremely shallow bugs when we had recursion that wasn't simple transitive closure. The moment we went to complex recursion, like double recursion, recursion through very complex other predicates, there was it, the code was not even debugged. So even though data log in principle has recursion, in practice most database people use it as just SQL with transitive closure. So there hasn't been as much sophistication there as one might think. Yeah. But at the same time, people have looked at optimizations uh, for quite a, you know, quite a large number of years, like magic sets. For magic sets is impressive for program specialization of, of data logs. So yes, it is a bit surprising that people have not uh, tried to come up with good principles for manual whole program optimization of highly recursive data log. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, and then. Uh, have you tried seeing what about just, uh, indexing on multiple variables? So, indexing on multiple variables in what we are presenting will be represented by just copying the relation twice yeah. because we're not really storing a relation, we're storing an index. So, this would be exactly indexing on multiple variables. What I was showing you before, this is really, uh, this store object field does two things. It really keeps the information of store field. Okay, of course, it filters it a little, but it also creates a new index. In some cases, we've had to just copy something and have the same, the exact same information in two different orderings, so, which is exactly what you said, have two indices, have multiple indices into exactly the same data. But that's been very, very rare. Typically, we have always managed to fuse this optimization together with something else, so to do actually useful computation, to never have two indices into the same data, produce new data as well. Yes? How big the uh, simple unoptimized specification is versus the optimized one with these new relations? Uh, not really, but it's not substantially simpler. I would say I gave you some data which say, the total of all analysis we have is a couple thousand lines of code. I would say it would be half that size for a, a completely unoptimized specification. So the optimization blows up the size by two, by roughly two, Base, mainly because of introducing intermediate relations like this one. Yes? Are you going to compare the memory costs also the different algorithms that you <coughs> Effectively, I'm implicitly comparing the memory cost in everything I've told you, because when I tell you that we scale to much more complex, to more complex algorithms than Paddle, it's exactly because of memory reasons and not so much time reasons. Everything runs on a 16 gigabyte machine, all the experiments that I discussed before, and pretty much it occupies all of memory. If we get out of memory, in the case of Paddle, we crash. In our case, we paid. We, we need to go to disk, and this exceeds our our benchmark time. So roughly the memory requirements are equivalent in everything we discuss. But there are a couple of, ca of caveats, which I'm going to mention in two slides. So we had to do some things that are highly domain specific to get economy of representation in our analysis. OK, so we don't use BDDs in our analysis. We don't use binary decision diagrams. Very quickly. If you've heard the term before, you need a refresher. A binary decision diagram is a very compact representation. It's a minimal representation of a relation. So it's a linked structure that, has, uh, that, that can be a DAG. It, can, it has uh, paths for true and false at every step. And a path, into, uh, a complete path from the root to a leave represents a tuple of that relation. So this can represent a much larger relation in explicit representation just because there are so many paths. So scalable, precise points to analysis in the past have used BDDs. I mentioned the BDD, BDDB system. I mentioned the paddle system. We use an explicit representation. And I'll try to explain what's the difference. There were a couple of questions. Yes, and then Ben. Yes. Are you guys planning to look at how to optimize 
distribute records of queries, or is that not even Distribute over the network, you mean, or yeah. on different machines? Yeah. We've tried. Uh, so we are trying. But we, this is something that we would like to get from the engine for free. So we would like the engine to do this without knowing anything about our program being a points to analysis. So we, we are not trying in the sense of this is not part of this work, but there is work on trying to distribute data log efficiently. In principle, you cannot do it. I mean, just take, uh, if we take just the complexity theory, it says that data log can capture all of P time. It has arbitrary recursion. Well, that's much richer than what you can do in parallel. It's not just transitive closure. But in specialized cases, obviously, every single join can be parallelized fairly efficiently. And if our recursion is simple, like transitive closure, then we can do something better. But in general, it's not going to be optimally parallelizable. But hopefully, we can get something for free now that there are multi cores. Yeah, like like sort of issue, right? I didn't hear the last. Sort of like in P2, um, they start saying where. Yes. So that's exactly what uh, the, the kinds of heuristics that people use to distribute data log, to do efficient parallel data log. And there was Ben. Yeah. It seems like the, one of the, the arguments for BDDs was that you could represent you know, like full context. You know, that was one of the claims. So you know, uh, it seemed, it, you know, so isn't, isn't it really apples and oranges? You can't really represent every programming context. You know, if, you mean unbounded depth yeah, context? Yeah. yeah, so we cannot represent unbounded depth context because we have to encode the context depth in our source code in the data log program. We actually use some macros so we, we can tune that. But in practice, this, has not show, this was not shown to ever be profitable. Okay. Effectively, a context sensitive heap gives you much better precision for much cheaper than unbounded uh, context. This, this is kind of not the best idea. Uh, as a trade-off. <laughs> that was a selling point, but, but this has been debunked to some extent. Okay. There were some claims about how many contexts you would have, and that's not precisely true. Those numbers are not precisely true. Yeah? Speaking of object sensitivity, how deep can you go there? Uh, how many contexts? How many levels of object sensitivity? So two, two is what we scale to right now. So right now, we have two object sensitive with a context sensitive heap is the most scalable. We can do three object sensitive without a context sensitive heap, but that's not a good uh, point of precision for the, for the effort. OK, so binary decision diagrams offer memory efficiency, but also they offer pretty heavy overheads. Uh, for instance, a shallow observation is to get a 48-bit tuple, you need to traverse 48 links. It's a linked data structure. It has no locality. So obviously, if you can represent everything as an ex explicit table and you don't suffer a blow up in, in size, then you win with an explicit representation. And there's also a lot of cost. That's the main one. There's cost of normalizing and minimizing every time you do a BDD operation. <coughs> so do they pay off? So we have not found in this domain the benefit of binary decision diagrams to outweigh their costs. Now, the relations are reducible, of course. They shrink quite a bit with BDDs. But they're not clearly extremely regular. They're not like relations that one finds typically in model checking. So, and we observe that even though we use BDD variable orderings that have been very heavily optimized. So the, the variable orderings that we explore and that we use in all the performance measurements are the ones that uh, uh, the paddle authors say yield impressive results. They're variable orderings that yield the smallest var points to relation and the best overall speed. So to be more specific, what we see is that, sure, the var points to relation with these variable orderings for BDDs are very small. So to step back, to, to go back one step just for general context, how well BDDs perform depends very heavily on the order of variables in the BDD. The same relation with different variable order can be represented much more verbosely uh, than a, a simpler variable ordering. So we found that the main relation is very small indeed, and the runtime may be minimal, but other relations may be quite large. We found no analysis over all the DaCapo benchmarks and all the analysis that we tried. We found no analysis where the optimal BDD ordering simultaneously minimized both, uh, I mean, relation var points to, but also field points to, 
and call graph edge. And all three are very crucial relations for the performance of a points to analysis. In other words, sure, you may get the globally best performance by minimizing the size of this. This is an observation that multiple groups have arrived at, uh, both the Stanford group and uh, uh, Andre Lodak and Laurie Hendren. But just because you get the best performance, it doesn't mean that this is minimal. It doesn't mean that this is minimal. And these can ruin your performance. And the differences in just a simple metric, like the ratio of facts over number of BDD nodes, can vary by as much as 30x. So this can be as low as 0.2, where this one is 8. And this is what really kills BDDs, that you optimize something, you get the best overall performance. But in order to do fast joins, you need to keep the same variable ordering throughout your relations. And some relations end up being big enough that they hurt you both in space and in time. So as a conclusion, we have not found so far that the points to analysis domain has enough regularity that BDDs are profitable. Okay, now I have to qualify this a little because BDDs are necessary if one is not very careful about precision. So if we were to specify some algorithms naively, we would blow up right away. We would not be able to fit them in memory. But we did some, we just introduced very simple algorithmic enhancements that both enhanced performance and got us to fit in memory. And this is one of those cases where you get a better algorithm and better performance at the same time. So it's a win-win. And there are just two enhancements. I already talked about on-the-fly exception handling. So propagate the exceptions and do the exception computation precisely as soon as possible. This turns out to be huge for object-sensitive analysis. The other is something very naive. Static initializers for Java classes, even for a context-sensitive analysis, they don't need to be handled context-sensitively. We just handle them context-insensitively, brought down the size of all relations tremendously. So if you are careful to not introduce extra redundancy, to not make your relations so big that you need BDDs to collapse down the space, but just because there is this artificial redundancy, then it's great results with an explicit representation, both in terms of precision and performance. The top one doesn't change precision. That's, the bottom one is strictly an improvement of precision. Top one is a no-op that just changes performance, really. So. Generally, very briefly, I'll talk about uh, future work. And I've started becoming very much a believer in declarative programming languages. I think this may be an instance of a greater domain. I said before that data log is first order logic together with recursion. Uh, actually, I didn't say that. I said data log captures the p-time complexity class. Effectively, it happens to be equivalent to doing first order logic, doing for all and exists to specify algorithms, and to allow unbounded recursion. Uh, and I plan to use many other declarative, logic-based languages in the future. And this is somewhat inspired by uh, the work of my colleague, Neil Immerman, on descriptive complexity. And I've been talking to Neil for quite a bit. For instance, one project that we have now is on a language that's first-order logic-based for guaranteed linear time single touts computation, where you touch every ob object on the heap exactly once. And this is for giving the programmer the ability to specify very simple invariant-like algorithms that run during garbage collection. So during garbage collection, you would do the traversal anyway. How can I give you a language that, since you're doing the work, you can also do some useful computation for me? And effectively, our language will be, uh, for all exists, access to any fields of an object, which corresponds to functions in the logic sense, and only one relation uh, and we have two or three choices that we can give to the programmer there. And this is work in progress. I'm working on that with Sam Geyer uh, and a student of his at Tufts. And I also, what I want to do in the future is try to come up with embedded languages for parallelism. So I'd like to have a small declarative logic-based language uh, that guarantees that any program you write in it will have optimal speed up and maybe embed, embed that in some mainstream language, and then let you write little query-like things, but then have full parallelism for you just for free. Anything you write in this language will be parallelized extremely efficiently. So what this language might be will be up to definition in the next year. So probably first order logic, and can, you do, can we do full transitive closure? I don't know. 
Can we do less than that? Most likely. So to conclude, what I talked about today is points to analysis with declarative languages. The kind of surprising result, we didn't set out to do that. We set out to just match existing algorithms. But the kind of surprising result is that this has raised the bar in precise points to analysis. Uh, we got an order of magnitude performance improvement. We used entirely declarative techniques and a fairly targeted optimization methodology. Uh, a human is in the loop, but the heuristics, the main principles, are exactly what I described. And the human in the loop is Martin Bravenbohr, who has been amazingly good at doing this work. And there were several lessons learned that are of more general value to the program analysis domain. Uh, for instance, the algorithmic enhancements that I uh, described a couple of slides back, or the, the whole discussion of whether BDDs are useful for the domain of points to analysis. And this concludes my talk. Ben. So, uh, uh, would this work have been, would you have had the same result if this logic box implementation of data logs had existed? If this what? If, 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 it, that, if that implementation of data log had existed? I think we would have the same result with any, with any implementation of uh, data log that's mature enough to just do semi-naive evaluation and to do local join ordering. So because that's all we're getting from the implementation. There, so any mature implementation of data log, how many are there? Yeah, yeah exactly. Not very many. Okay. But the point is that this gave us a platform on top of which we could experiment. So this is what made the problem kind of incremental so we could actually invent things that were specific to the domain of points to analysis. The problem, again, is that there were no efficient platforms for data log out there. But with the parameters that people had discussed about da efficient data log implementations, semi-naive evaluation, local, join, local query optimization, single line joins, uh, those are kind of essential. Anyone who would, optimize, who would implement data log industrially would have to use those. And we would just exploit that and get exactly the same results. Because all we do is introduce special indices, nothing special. The, the idea is different, like how, when we decide to introduce the special indices, but what we get from the engine is not that deep. Yes? I'm just curious about the, so the order of magnitude performance movement, can you give us uh, some idea about the absolute uh, values here? I mean, it's like a, a minute becomes a second, or in one day no, it's an uh, hour? It's, or, uh, or a second it's this. It's like, a couple, second? it's like a couple of hours. Like, these are the decapo benchmarks. So for, for the slowest ones, let's say, a couple of hours for a fairly simple analysis uh, become 10 minutes or less than 10 minutes. So eight minutes goes to two hours. So it's, it's very significant in terms of real time. We, we, con we concentrate much more, because of heavy overheads for everything else, we concentrate much more on precise analysis. So we care about fairly precise, context-sensitive analysis. We don't care that much to show you. We also get 10x performance improvements in context insensitive analysis, for instance, compared to Paddle. But this is not something that Paddle has been optimized for. So I'm not going to tell you that this is the best way to implement very simple analysis, very cheap analysis. This is, the, this is a very good way to implement expensive analysis. Yes? So how accountable is this data value? The reason I'm asking is if we just parallelize this and say, OK, if we're not even operating efficiently and we're only interested in decreasing time, still, would we be able to cut down the analysis time? So in principle, the algorithms would not be too amenable to parallelism for the same reason I was discussing before, which is that they have full recursion, which is the hardest thing to parallelize. Like for instance, just a depth first search, if the order matters, is unparallelizable. Uh, but in practice, you can always get for free just a factor of three or four or five. But that's about the limit that you can get for free. Now, whether one can rewrite the program to do something clever with the recursion, uh, transform it into some form of tail recursion, some, some form, I don't know what it would be, that would be easier to parallelize, transitive closure of some kind, that I do not know yet. And we have not concentrated on that. There may be related work in the full data log literature on that. But I, I'm not sure that there is. I mean, the, the work that I've seen, I, I keep seeing work about parallelizing data log. I keep seeing posters. At PLDI, there was a poster this year. Keep seeing, was that you? No, no, <laughs> sorry. 
Uh, I keep seeing things like that. They, there's nothing sophisticated there. There's nothing particularly sophisticated. It's, it's the low-hanging fruit that people are trying to get, not trying to transform the data log program in order to get to expose much more parallelism. Ben, you had? No. Yes. So you mentioned that uh, with all these optimizations, your implementation is even orders of magnitude faster than the hand-to-end specific uh, implementations. Right. Of course, these rely on a backend that's BDD-based, and we don't have BDDs. But yes. So I was wondering uh, why did other people were not able to come up with these uh, insights earlier? Is it because once you go down to a declarative specification, then is it that these insights become clearer? Which is, I think is a very interesting message. Well, it's first of all, just the amount, just the complexity that's involved. So I started the talk by saying that here's the number of algorithms that I found in a single 10-page paper on points to analysis. And these are all from a single paper. You get the idea that if you are at the imperative level, there's so much complexity. And there are so many decisions that are fused in there. And they're very hard to decouple. By going to the declarative level, we had the full freedom to say, we're just representing relations here. What do we need as our backend data structure? What do we need as our optimization methodology? What's interesting to do to get incrementalization? So for instance, Paddle would be the closest thing, because Paddle, well, maybe not the closest thing. BDD, BDDB would be the closest thing. But it, it also uses imperative code, especially for call graph, et cetera. But Paddle has a high level relational language. It's very hard to optimize because the loop to reach fixed point and the incrementalization has to be done by hand. There's just the semi-naive evaluation, which is a very simple thing. We got that taken care of for free. So yes, I think that it would be much harder to come up with the same insights in an imperative setting. The declarative setting freed us and gave us the, the ability to, to reason at a very high level and just introduce the optimization. Now, having said all that, obviously the results are surprising, right? That we could get such performance increase is very surprising. When we set out to do this, we would be happy to be two times slower. Uh, there was a question from this Ben and then that Ben, or not? Uh, no, actually, I'll just say, I, I think that you know, like a lot of things, when you cleanly separate the algorithm from the engine to ex the execution engine, um, you get a huge win. I mean, and there have been a number of circumstances. BDD, BD, whatever. That was another instance of this, you know, but they use a different execution engine. And I, you know, I, think, I think it's a brilliant insight, and it's great to see the work. And I think part of it is the question of how quickly these, ex these engines evolve. I mean, if, now there'll be a reason for people to make a better data log, go out and make a parallel and whatever. It'll just make all your analysis that much faster. Yes. So. Of course, there are many people who are deep believers in data log in various domains, just because it gives you this very compact declarative uh, specification. But I agree that these kinds of performance improvements are not something that people had in mind uh, in the past. It's more the specification improvements that people had thought of. Still have a question? Uh, yeah, so you don't that? really demand that much of the backend. You really just want to have some uh, simple relational algebra operations there. So if you didn't have a BDD-based backend, would you still see an improvement on top of the optimizations? If we it? did have. Yeah. And certainly not in considerable that you would use BDD, BDB for instance as such. It's a very different cost model. So we did a couple of experiments, a couple of micro benchmarks in the paper. It's an extremely different cost model because in a BDD based backend, the, uh, the cost of doing the join is nothing. Once you have everything in the right order, doing the join and getting back a relation is extremely quick. Renormalizing that re relation may take a while. Because it's such a different execution model, it's very hard to say without doing it what benefit we would get. The whole, all the, all the smarts that went into our implementation in terms of introducing new indices, they might not apply at all to a BDD-based backend. Again, because it's a very different cost model for joins. We, all we did was optimize the joins by introducing the right indices. Yes. Um, did you did you find you wanted other features in data law like function symbols or second order quantification or anything like that? Um, no, no, but uh, it's very easy to not need something when you know you don't have it. There's no way to get it. I, I would say. Uh, so 
there are definitely algorithms that people have wanted to express where they would require more complex things. Even what I mentioned before, the unbounded context. Mm -hmm. Sure, it would be great if we had if we had functions, if it was really like Prolog. Mm -hmm. But that's not that's not easy, and it might hinder the ability of the engine to optimize things locally, which we rely on. Definitely, we don't do any local optimization. We write rules that have six relations on the right-hand side, on the body, and we don't care about how they're going to be ordered. We only care about which ones will be deltas, and we rely on the engine to do the local query optimization and make sure that, oh, we first join the small ones, and then we index into the big ones. That we just take for granted. So there are a lot of optimizations that are going on within the There's, The local optimization is done automatically by the data log engine. And definitely, we don't want to mess with its ability to do anything for us by just adding more expressiveness. No. So we're almost out of time. Maybe one more question? OK, well, let's just thank the speaker.